Good evening, everybody. Um, Catherine Cronin and I are both thrilled and delighted to have Pragna Patel in Chambers today with us and to be in conversation with Pragna Patel as part of International Women's Day. And what a momentous day it is with Nazarene, Nazanin, sorry, Zagari Radcliffe, hopefully back in the UK very, very soon. Um, as some of you might know, Catherine Cronin and I are both barristers at Garden Court. Um, Catherine uh, Cronin and myself are both in the immigration team, and Catherine does um, both immigration and family court work. And she's the go-to person for anything super complicated um, uh, that any barrister has. Um, and Catherine's joining us by Zoom today. Um, Pragna, we have known each other for so many years um, and both have an absolute love for supporting the Indian cricket team. Mm. And I know what a huge impact that you've had on my development um, as an immigration lawyer, um, but also you've had a huge impact on women's rights through your work at Southfield Black Sisters and beyond. Um, your activism has literally been on the streets, um, your, strat your strategic ca campaigning and litigation has led to policy and legal change and in every sense of the word you are a game changer and you have been a game changer. So I just wanted to start by taking you back because I think it is interesting to go backwards in time. Um, do you remember that we both visited the Migration Museum recently and we saw these amazing photographs of um, Asian immigrants landing at the airports in the UK coming out of the planes onto those old staircases, not the tunnels. Um, in the 60s. Um, I know you were a child immigrant from Kenya to the UK. How did that immigrant experience, do you think, develop your identity and your politics? Well, first of all, can I just thank you for inviting me, you and Catherine Cronin. It's been an absolute honour. It is an absolute honour to be here. Um, and to celebrate um, International Women's Day, and particularly, uh, we hope, as means of very reckless freedom. Um, I think that the way in which her husband has campaigned for her freedom has lessons for us all on how not to give up. Um, going back to the question of um, migration and my very first memories, um, yes, um, when, I, when I visited that migration museum with you, um, I found it a really incredibly moving and quite astonishing experience, astonishing in the sense that I'm surprised that this country has not sponsored a proper migration museum um, and that those who have uh, put together these exhibitions um, and trying to set up a permanent migration museum are struggling as much as they are. Um, I think it's such an important initiative and to be supported. But looking at those images as we were walking around of Asian migrants coming into the UK in the 60s very much resonated with my experience as a five-year-old walking off, and I can't remember the name of the plane, it's probably BOAC or something like that, and walking down the stairs. It was a cold December, uh, dark evening, I remember that clearly. Um, and I remember as I came down the stairs with her mother, um, and my youngest sisters, who, whose hands she was holding, um, just feeling the eyes of the world were on us. And um, feeling very, obviously at that time, I wouldn't have been able to give a name to that feeling, but I think it was a feeling of discomfort at being stared at. And I've never, and, and, you know, vivid memory of wondering why people were staring at us. Um, and I think it, looking back now, it's for two reasons. One was, of course, we were the colour, the colour of our skin, um, and the difference, you know, the difference um, in our appearance. Um, and secondly, I was wearing flip flops and a sleeveless <laughs> yellow dress, cotton dress. And I think people must have thought we were mad, you know, to sort of land up in the UK dressed as if we were in the tropics. Um, and so those are my very, very first memories of arriving in this country 
um, not really understanding that we were migrants, um, but very much aware that we were outsiders. As I, my formative years in school, um, seeing the world through the eyes of my parents who struggled, they were economic migrants. My father uh, was born in Kenya. My mother married, she was from India, married him and then um, joined him in Kenya. He was of course Indian in origin, but his own history, migration history to Kenya is wrapped up in the history of indentured labor um, in the aftermath of uh, the abolition of slavery. And, um, and he hitchhiked his way to the UK. In the 60s, there was a sort of Africanization policy sweeping Africa. Uh, countries gaining, former colonies were gaining independence. And there was a sense that Asians who had been brought there by the British and others were not were no longer uh, uh, safe. So they Asians very much felt insecure. So I think my father decided that in 1964 that it was time to leave Kenya and try and make a future for himself in, in this country. And he hitchhiked his way all the way to the UK. And I have to say, it must have been quite a hazardous journey for him uh, without any money, um, not knowing what the future would bring. Um, obviously not as hazardous as it is for many, many migrants now trying to make the journey to the West. But, um, you know, so I was very much aware of, of the experience of migrant, uh, the experience of being outsiders in the UK, sensing their kind of frustration and struggle at trying to obtain employment, trying to obtain housing, struggling to maintain at that time four children plus heavy jobs in factories. Um, so seeing the racism that they faced in, in trying to sort of survive on a daily basis, and then my own sort of experiences of racism in school. So in primary school, it was very much, um, it seemed like innocent banter, but of course it was underlaid by a kind of racism, uh, a soft racism, if you like, when you know children are telling you, go back to your own country, or you're smelly, or uh, you eat your weird sense of dress or whatever. You know, my mother wore a sari in those days. Um, but in secondary school, the racism that I faced was quite menacing. There was always this kind of underlying intimidation and threat um, in the way in which, you know, you were targeted as outsiders. It was a casual kind of racism, but there was a menacing aspect to it. And that was quite hard, actually. So growing up sort of in that kind of environment when racism was quite raw, it was quite visceral. It was quite visceral, both in terms of institutionalized racism, but also on the streets, you know, you were going to confront racism. As a young, as a female, it probably didn't feel as physical as it did for young black and Asian men, you know, but nevertheless, it was there. It was there and you just had to navigate and survive it. That's how it felt. It was normalized um, and there was no name given to it. There was no multiculturalism in schools. There was no attempt to make you feel that your identity mattered, that your history mattered, that you were uh, equal. You know, there was no attempt, Black History Month, in, you know, it was not a concept that had been invented at the time. So there was no sense of celebrating difference in a positive way. Um, so it was all, you were very much left on your own to try and figure it all out. Um, so seeing those photos, of seeing those images of migrants landing, in this case Asians landing in the UK, not knowing what their future is going to hold, how they're going to survive, many with children, must have been an incredible, um, you know, feeling for many of those people and you can see it on their faces and you can see it etched out in their demeanor and their body language you know of arriving somewhere and um starting out again if you like i mean i can't imagine what it must be like 
to uproot yourself and start again in a country that you're unfamiliar with, that you don't speak the language, you don't have money, I can't, and you have children, you have dependents, I cannot imagine what it must be like. Uh, um, but I know, I have insights from seeing how my parents struggled. So I have a strong memory of social and racial unrest in the UK in the 70s um, and 80s. And of course, in West London, there was the death of Blair Peach in 1979. Mm. How did you go from being the child that arrived to the young adult at 22, um, mm. setting up South, being a founder member of South Wales? This is at the age of 22, when most 22 year olds probably wouldn't have been doing that at that time, particularly in Southall, which was very edgy mm. and very, very mm. socially conservative and religiously conservative. I think there were two reasons. One was that that experience of racism, um, I think, um, made me want to work out my identity. Okay. It wasn't, it, I could, did not feel comfortable being an outsider and being ashamed of being an outsider, if I'm honest. So the question for me was a quest for how do I fit in? How do I, how do I be proud of who I am? And that led me to look for positive role models, you know. And it just so happened that um, there were racial uprisings in Southall. Um, and even before 1979, there was 1976 with the murder of a young Asian lad by the name of Gurdip Singh Jagger, who was killed by a bunch of fascist hooligans, you know. So that was the first time that you saw a community of largely Asians. Now, at that time, there were racial uprisings across the UK, and there have been for, for, since the 50s, but they were mainly led by African Caribbean youth. So this was the first time that you saw Asian youth rising up against racism. In 1976, there were uprisings, but nothing on the scale that took place in 1979 that led to the murder of Blair, Blair Beach. At that time, I was in sixth form. I knew no activists in Southall, I remember ringing up, um, and I wanted to so much be involved, be a part of the kind of defense of Southall against the kind of the racism, you know, the, the National Front were marching through the, the community in a really provocative manner and the state had failed to protect the community from their racism and their fascism and their hooliganism. And um, so the community decided to rise up and defend itself. That's where the slogan, the anti-racist slogan, self-defense is no offense, comes from. Mm. Um, and it was an attempt of uh, to uni unite the community. And what was amazing about that moment uh, uh, in the uprisings was that it was young men and women of Asian background, uh, old and young, right? Um, from all religious backgrounds, from all ethnic, kind of Asian ethnic backgrounds, coming together in what was a moment of unity and very much supported by many anti-racist supporters who came from all over the country, um, including Blair Peach, of course, who was the white um, anti-racist activist who was killed by the special patrol group. Um, but seeing the kind of ways in which the uh, young, particularly young Asian men and women had responded, actually just sparked, ignited something in me about, you know, not moving from uh, m being ashamed of oneself, ashamed of my background, to being proud of who I was and ready to defend who I was. And so it was that, that kind of, you know, that revelation that there was another way of being an Asian, which wasn't a perpetual victim, that you could resist, and that you should be proud of who you are in that, and that resistance is part of that, was what drove me to, you know, sort of Southall Black Sisters. The other, the other influence was, of course, being a woman. Grew up in a, as you say, you know, in a family that was uh, very loving, but very patriarchal. And there were very few choices for women growing up in my family and community. And marriage was the only option. So 
to get out of that, to get out of, you know, I had to fight my own personal battles against a forced marriage, for example. And, and I very much, again, you know, it was that kind of a need to assert my identity, which didn't have to be so restrictive and constricted. Um, and the need to see, you know, the question for me was why are women just forced down a particular route, motherhood and children, and no other choices, you know, uh, no other aspirations, no other dreams allowed. And it was both of those influences, the need to resist racism, the need to resist patriarchy, that brought me to Southall when I finished at university, uh, where I became politicized through student politics and the burgeoning anti-racist movement had taken off. There were marches against, at that time, the Nationality Bill, which resonates now with the Borders and Nationality Bill that, you know, that's going through Parliament. But there were demonstrations against those, you know, those um, immigration measures that were coming in. There was demonstrations against um, police brutality and racism. And um, when I came to Southall and saw young Asian women who were asserting a feminism, a black feminism, that really made me realize that that is my home. That is where my identity, my identity is tied to this. So it was that that led me to um, uh, become a member of Southall Black Sisters, which is a group, a campaigning group at the time. But when I finished university and came back and joined Southall Black Sisters, the founding members had left or were on the verge of leaving. But I had just discovered myself and discovered politics, so I wasn't going anywhere. So I felt that it was, it was you know, that I could revive the group and um, move it forward and applied for and got funding from the then GLC to set up uh, the first advocacy centre for black and minority women in the area. And the aim was to both provide frontline services to women, but to use that experience to campaign and bring about long term change. And that change shouldn't just come from moments of uprising and upheaval and resistance. But change should come in the daily, in the daily uh, activities that you do. So that was very much, you know, what led me to sort of become part of South of Black Sisters and to take it forward. But it was complicated and hard to claim public spaces for women it was at very, that time. Very publicly, very hard for two reasons, for three reasons. First of all, you were in a community that was highly patriarchal. Right, religious and community leaderships were men, traditionalists, conservatives, you know, um, highly patriarchal. There was no public space for women. Even though women had been in the public space resisting against racism and so on. But certainly women were not uh, permitted to be in public spaces to raise issues affecting women, like domestic violence, sexual violence, forced marriage, honor-based violence, all of these things. Um, so that was very difficult because you were going against the grain of your patriarchal, the patriarchal values that they like to promote. And you were raising what they were saying, issues that should stay internal to the community and not, you know, lift the lid on, on community, not in an atmosphere of febrile racism, you know, because it only fueled racist. Uh, racists and racist uh, and attention and media attention which would, um, you know, sort of brand Asian communities as backwards, as, as barbaric, even as traditional and, you know, not civilized because, you know, there's all this forced marriage and domestic violence and all this stuff going on. So the traditionalists and conservatives don't, we don't want to raise these issues. It will fuel racism, but also it will ups, uh, disrupt the patriarchal status quo. Thank you very much. You know, we're politicians. We can decide what's needed for the community yeah. and represent the community needs. So on the one hand, that was really, really difficult to uh, operate in that kind of atmosphere. On the other hand, there was an anti, a burgeoning anti-racist movement, but it was sexist. There were no women in leadership positions. You know, women were, 
you know, basically women's issues were again relegated to second class status, you know, we'll deal with that after the revolution kind of idea. Mm -hmm. right? So that was always the problem within the anti-racist movement is the gender question never came up, the women's question never came up, and women were not in positions of leadership. And the third issue was the feminist movement, second wave feminism was also on the rise and you know there were campaigns for shelters for battered women uh, you know abortion rights um, equal pay all of these campaigns were kind of swirling around us but there the question they were silent on the question of race so race never came up so trying to occupy a public space in that situation as a black person as a woman he, you know and also working class background, to be honest, you know, was not easy, but it was necessary. And one of the things we always said, and of course there are other women who joined South of Black Sisters, and our mantra was always that you cannot resist one form of oppression at the expense of another. And you cannot remain silent about other forms of oppression because silence is complicity. And so it's really, really vital that we did not create hierarchies of struggle. The struggle against racism could not be waged at the expense of the struggle against women's rights. And that could not be waged at the expense of, at the expense of struggles for workers' rights or for class equality, you know, and so on. And it was, it was working out how do you join these dots? How do you bridge anti-racism, feminism, and um, you know, sort of rights uh, and, and those um, working around other issues to do with social justice. How do you bridge that is the challenge. And it's not been an easy challenge. And we did operate in, in a climate of immense hostility um, where, you know, the conservatives and the traditionists tried to shut us down and said that we were working against the grain of cult, uh, cultural values Indian values, however they wanted to define them, we were working against them. Feminism was a Western concept. Um, and so all of these things were being, you know, we were labeled all of these things. Um, on the other hand, anti-racists didn't want us to raise women's issues because it would fuel the racism and it would set back the anti-racist struggle. And feminism, on the other hand, didn't want to raise the question of, you know, didn't want to discuss the kind of fault line of race and how um, feminism has also got to, uh, sexism is also mediated through race and so on, and you have to deal with that. So, you know, some of the, some of the early campaigns that we waged, um, for example, South of Black Sisters, uh, very much part of the struggle in exposing the early uh, virginity testing that was taking place against Asian women in the late 70s and 80s. And uh, this was against, effectively, this was, due to immigration policies, right? And the way in which the state at the time had imposed uh, rules around how you came to the UK. And if you were a spouse, um, you know, you had to fulfill certain criteria in order to demonstrate that you were a spouse. And for Asian women, the, the racist and actually sexist assumption was that we could tell whether an Asian woman coming to the UK as a spouse is a bogus, is a bogus claim or not, uh, by doing medical tests, by carrying out medical tests. So the assumption was that all Asian women are virgins before they marry. So if they're not virgins at the border, then they could be turned away because they're clearly not entering this country as valid spouses. They're entering this country because they've either entered a sham marriage or they're is, you know, it's, um, or they're coming in for other reasons. So that 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 issue, for example, raises many raise you know raises the ways in which there is that intersection of race and sex here, yeah, right? So we have a situation where the policies themselves are racist, institutionalized racism. I actually think it's also institutionalized sexism because of the way in which Asian women were specifically targeted. You know, and so the anti-racist movement was very quick to denounce the racism of the immigrant underlying the immigration policies. But actually, there was a feminist response to this, too, which was that it is both races. 
but it is also sexist because it is a it is an invasion of women's bodily autonomy right and their privacy and it's a sexual assault on women so if that you know those those that issue itself raises and it shows how race and sex and all these systems of power intersect and how the response therefore must deal with that intersection because it raises all these all and intersectionality violations. intersectionality race class gender is yeah and we were doing huge. intersectionality before it was it became the buzzword to be fair um it's you know it was coined by an american legal scholar um who who was trying to show how um, black women in the context of the US in the workplace, um, how their discrimination in the workplace was affected by both their race and their sex. So they were getting l less pay than compared to black men and also less pay compared to white women working in the same environment. So she was trying to show how intersectionality worked there. We were doing intersectionality, although we didn't, you know, use that term. But I think the, uh, the point about that is that what Kimberly Crenshaw, when she talked about intersectionality and what we were doing when we were talking about intersectionality, is we weren't talking about identities. I mean, nowadays, intersectionality is reduced to this kind of very glib understanding of multiple identities. So you kind of add identity on top of identity on top of identity, as if that somehow explains, you know, the experience of oppression and what uh, what Kimberly Crenshaw did, and I think what well, my understanding of intersectionality is that it's very much about intersecting systems of oppression. Mm -hmm. It's about structural oppression, and it's understanding that as opposed to kind of just you know that we we all carry multiple identities kind of an understanding of intersectionality. So yes, we were trying to really grapple with what is the experience of black women you know how do all these things shape the existence of black women and i'm talking about day, women in the workplace women in their homes women facing domestic violence sexual violence women who are domestic servants women who are working in factories you know it's it's about understanding how, those daily realities and 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 um and trying to work out how you resist those forms of oppression. I was just going to see if Catherine wanted to add anything at this point because I'm, I'm conscious that we've had these discussions about the, the history of the immigration rules and uh, immigration policy in relation to women and the domestic violence um, rule and intersectionality. Well, uh, I mean, certainly, I think I think that intersectionality is just incredibly important. It's why my practice tends to straddle at least two of the two of the sections, because you you find women's uh, that you can only deal with the issue by by. I mean, we we divide all these things up in terms of if it's an immigration problem or a family problem as as lawyers, but um, but in fact, you, one has to get the um, uh, the solution across it. And I must say, one of the really wonderful things about SBS is just how they have straddled those um, th th those forms of, of separation. And the domestic violence is just a classic because I think of all the definitions that one gets in the legal system, that is one that really does pretty pretty well actually reflect the way in which domestic violence occurs and and how uh, how one has to have a a broad sense of 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 who are the oppressors who are the victims and how the forms it takes mm -hmm. and the other part that i was involved with sbs with was of course with stranded spouse mm -hmm. and that was another dimension um, or intersection if you like to that to that um, understanding and the, uh, the work that SBS did was just marvelous in that in just going to the family court getting the president mm. wonderful James Munby to sit down with with you and and change the definition in yeah. the family practice rules and and how that then forced the home office to mm. revisit it so 
just to talk about that, I think, would be fantastic. Well, I think the area of work where, where we look at the ways in which domestic violence and uh, immigration laws and policy intersect is a really important area. And I think it kind of helps to inform exactly that intersectional analysis, you know, because you have a situation where, um, on the whole, many women um, who uh, are migrants who are in this country, um, some as spouses um, of British nationals or those who are resident here, some who've come through other visa routes, um, who then, uh, but whose status is insecure. Um, and dependent on their on their partners or their spouses for their survival, um, who are then because of their insecure status, are also subject to what's called the no recourse to public funds condition, and that is that creates that that those immigration laws and policies create the environment that is conducive to violence against women, because perpetrators know. That their insecure state, their insecure status uh, means that they cannot access the welfare safety net because of the no recourse condition, and that they're totally dependent economically and in every other way on the on them for their survival. So women are dependent. So that creates also conditions of impunity. You can oppress, you can neglect, you can be cruel, you can rape, you can se sexually assault physically assault, you can gaslight, you can, you know, um, um, deprive you, the partner of uh, any kind of financial resources, you can do all these things, coercive, you can be as coercive as you like in this setup, without anyone coming back for two reasons. One is because if women um, say anything, they may find that instead of being protected and supported, they are reported to immigration authorities for the purposes of being, um, you know, immigration controls. And secondly, even if that they can overcome that fear, there's nowhere to go because they can't access the welfare safety net. So it was the combination of the intersection of immigration, um, restrictive immigration rules and policies, and oppressive, patriarchal, um, you know, sort of, a value as systems that um, that generated violence against women, and the two come together in in a very interesting way. Perpetrators are immune from prosecution because women are too afraid to say anything, so the state is complicit in the violence that is perpetrated, and the state itself is also doing nothing to support women. That led us actually, and in a, on a, you know on a, on a real level, on a on a daily level. It meant that if you was trying to support women, there was nothing you could do. You couldn't send them to the local authority because they couldn't access that support. You couldn't help them apply for benefits. They couldn't access anything. You couldn't even send them to a refuge because refuges themselves rely on rental income and housing benefit that women uh, uh, can gain and universal credit and all these things so that women can support themselves in refuges. So all of this was, ex women are excluded, migrant women are excluded from all of this. And we managed, it was a 20 year campaign, but we managed to, uh, as a result of incessant campaigning, managed to persuade uh, in the 90s, the Labour, then Labour government, to bring in a rule which was the domestic violence rule, which didn't help all migrant women, but it certainly uh, helped migrant women who came on spousal visas to obtain, um, you know, to, to be able to leave a, an abusive relationship and claim benefits and apply for indefinite leave to remain if they can fulfill certain criteria and show that they're subject to domestic abuse. And we were able to ensure that uh, the no recourse criteria was waived in, in their case. So they had pending their indefinite leave to remain applications, they had access to basic welfare benefits. And we know as practitioners that we secured women's rights. But absolutely. I, and you know, it's, I, we've had notable successes and, and um, failures, you know, in, in my 40 years at SBS. This is one of the ones I'm most proud of, 
because it is so difficult to stand up against the immigration edifice. You know, it's institutionalized racism, you know, manifest. It is what it is. And, you, and challenging that becomes harder and harder as the policies become harsher and harsher. So that was really, really um, uh, a really important, um, you know, sort of progress for us. But then we were also getting, and this is the interesting thing about it, in an era of globalization, is that perpetrators become clever at how they perpetrate abuse. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, what perpetrators were doing was if their spouses were dependent on them, um, as part of their coercive controlling behavior and their abuse, they were taking those spouses back to their countries of origin and abandoning them there because they knew that if they remained in the UK, they might find ways to access rights. But in their countries of origin where the welfare system, the legal systems are weak or non-existent, it's very easy to keep women in a state of complete terror and dependency, you know, and in a state of limbo. So what we were seeing actually in an era of globalization is what I call violence in transnational spaces, violence against women in transnational spaces, where no one country takes responsibility, you know, for the, the, the fate that women find themselves in because they, um, their situation straddles many jurisdictions. So really what Catherine is referring to is the way in which we try to plug that particular gap by seeking to acknowledge the issue uh, in law, uh, by get, seeing the issue of transnational marriage abandonment, which is what this was, recognized in law and policy. And we managed to persuade the president of the family division um, to, you know, they, they use, they have practice guidance for lawyers in the family courts in relation to domestic violence. And we managed to insert, have him, and you know, obviously got his attention, and and he was very, very receptive. Actually, um, it was it was a pleasure working with him, but he was very keen to um, do something around the issue of transnational marriage abandonment, and all he had to do was tweak the practice guidance in relation to the family courts on domestic abuse, and inserted transnational marriage abandonment as a form of domestic abuse in that in the practice guidance and that has had a really liberating effect it is one also helped those women access legal aid because transnational marriage abandonment is recognized as a form of domestic abuse and if you're suffering domestic abuse you can access legal aid so it's helped a lot of lawyers you know access legal aid for their clients in these situations so that they can be advised and represented in the family courts but it's also now put pressure on the immigration authorities to reflect that recognition in immigration laws. Because even if the family courts have recognized it, the immigration authorities don't. Which means that if women try to return to the UK, they're denied entry, you know. So that remains an ongoing struggle. But I have to say, I don't know if Catherine's aware of this, but recently we've managed to revive as you know following a hiatus due to covid we've managed to revive working group meetings with the home office and we've got one actually coming up next week and they're keen to do something around transnational marriage abandonment so it is progress it's slow it's painful and you know and it's sort of lots of setbacks along the way but it just shows that if you persevere with something with something that sooner or later you could grind down. I wanted to ask opponent. you about perseverance because you've talked about your 40 years of feminist activism yeah. and activism. What what um, reflections have you got about that, about your activism and what reflections have you got about your activism going forwards? Hmm. Good question, Navita. Um What I would say is that it's not rocket science. Right. It is something that I think we all have responsibility to, to do. If you see a wrong, you've got to stand up and call it out and do something about it. It doesn't have to be big dramatic gestures. It can just be being kind, take it, you know, just being kind and being vigilant and, and, and just being aware um, of what is going on around you, joining any local campaigns, whether it's around saving the NHS or 
uh, you know, around refugee and migrant rights, whatever it is, or um, working in a shelter for battered women, whatever it is. So I think what I've learned is that um, activism is vital, more so now than ever, because globally things have taken a turn to the right. What we are seeing in many countries is the rise of authoritarian populism, you know, and, and many leaderships have gained power on the back of dem democracies, but are using their power to shut down democracies. And that includes shutting down the right to dissent and the right to protest. And we've seen it in this country. We're seeing some of the worst, some of, some of the most pernicious for pieces of legislation coming in, you know, the policing bill, which attempts to uh, really shut down protest and limit the spaces that you have to dissent as citizens. So I think um, it is really important that we uh, resist, that we challenge. I mean, SBS's mantra throughout the 40 years is um, struggle, not submission. And I think that what I've also learned is not to be afraid, is not to be afraid of authority, to actually challenge authority and, 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 and feel confident in, in that challenge. If the gut instinct tells you something is wrong, then it probably is wrong. Mm -hmm. And the need to challenge that, not worry about how you challenge, whether it's a sophisticated, articulate argument or whether it's just making sure that you have called something out. So I think those, those, that's what I think I've learned. And I've also learned that perseverance is important. And that, you know, sooner or later, um, you, you can win some battles. You know, you may not win the war. You may not, you know, in your lifetime, see the kind of society you want to see. But I think, and somebody else, and I, uh, um, a historian and a, socialist scholar in, 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 in the US has said this, put this very well and eloquently than I can. But I don't think we wait for a grand utopia, right? Mm -hmm. It's what we do in the moment. And if in the moment all we do is understand and challenge some of the wrongs that, that, that are taking place, then that in itself is a victory. And being kind and being compassionate is also important because I think these things have been sucked out of our movements, you know, and our movements themselves, I think, social justice movements are as amenable to dogmatism as are, you know, the, those who are in power. And we do need to guard against that ourselves. And so self-reflection is important in our social justice movements. Um, but I think it's about not being afraid and it's about persevering that I think is key to change. And would that be your advice to a younger generation of activists? Definitely. Definitely. I mean, you know, the younger generation, in some ways, it's fantastic seeing Black Lives Matter movement, the Me Too movement. You know, they're much more um, savvy with technology, which is both uh, opens up possibilities as well as closed down. Uh, democratic spaces. So I think these are, you know, but I think that they are, they have more resources at their disposal than we did. But I don't think that um, there is any substitute for activism. I'm, not, I'm talking about activism and not clicktivism, not sitting in front of a computer, but activism. What you did know, you say, clicktivism? Clicktivism, <laughs> you know, where you think that, you know, just by pressing a button and saying, sign the petition. I will sign this petition is enough. Um, and I think that's why we have to guard and be so vigilant against the ways in which democratic spaces are being shut down because it requires us to get on the streets and to fight back. So activism is still relevant? Absolutely relevant. Alice Walker said, activism is the rent I pay to live on this planet. And we're all privileged to be living on this planet. And we all have a responsibility to each other and to the planet. Thank you. I think, um, I don't know what the time is. It's about quarter to six. Was it Catherine? I think you're muted. Um, it, it, 
really, in a sense, you've more than answered it, but I think you might just want to add some further words. It, it's from Vikita, who says, she begins by saying the words you speak are so relatable, but then she poses a question, how can we continue to further the progress of rights of coloured women, both in their own communities and out? Mm. I, think, I think we have no choice but to... Um, carry on campaigning for the rights of, I prefer to use the word black because I, uh, you know, for me, black is invested with the political analysis and values that I, um, that shaped my thinking from the 80s. Um, but I think it's very, very important that we continue to fight for women's rights in the context of black and minority communities. And that means actually challenging all the ways in which black and minority women are affected by whether it's state oppression or whether it's patriarchal oppression or whether it's any other form of discrimination. And we were talking just before actually the session started about police brutality. And you know, there was a story in the papers about a 15 year old, a black 15 year old girl who was strip searched in a school of all places. Um, a, a horrific um, experience um, by state actors who know a thing or two about safeguarding. So what, uh, you know, an incredible dereliction of duty there um, and the need to be able to call that out and to mobilize against that kind of form of police brutality, not just against black people, but in this case against women themselves and girls. I mean, the strip searching of women has a very different dimension mm. to strip searching of men, you know, and I think we need to understand that experience and, and be able to articulate that experience um, as, uh, you know, one of the most vilest forms of discrimination that they can be. So I think we have to carry on uh, campaigning around these things, whether it's police brutality or whether it's domestic abuse. But I would say one thing, as black women, we are as affected by the demise of the welfare state or the, and, you know, the NHS as we are by police racism. And so it is also incumbent upon us to challenge these things and to find ways of making connections with other social justice movements because we're not going to achieve anything on our own. And I do think that the um, there's a really impressive woman called Alicia Garza, who was one of the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement. And, and then of course, it's gone global. And, and she's been amazing in, in how she galvanize um, around you know police brutality in the US but it's if you ever get a chance to listen to her it's really important because she is talking about how the Black Lives Matter movement must also talk about women's rights must also talk about the rights of workers you know domestic workers are also black and white minority women you know and what happens to them uh, migrants the rights of migrant women, you know, at the, it's very easy if you're a settled minority community to forget about the rights of migrant, the new migrants. So all of these things are about the struggle, the black, are, you know, part of black women's struggles. You might prioritize certain things because you can't do everything, but having that expansive idea of social justice is key to progressing the rights of black women, but also of all women. We could talk more. We haven't talked about all your landmark cases, but I thought it would be like helpful or nice if we took some questions, um, if that's all right, Catherine. Absolutely. I can't see any currently on the poll. Oh. oh, yes, just a comment, um, just that it was shocking what happened to the young child. Oh, here's Alice to everyone saying, I'd like to come back to any tips for maintaining perseverance. 
very tel <laughs> sort of appropriate. Um, increasingly, it feels like more awareness advocating for social movements are burning out in the face of massive resistance and what feels like not only little progress, but in fact, taking steps backwards. Um, see, for example, recent proposals about abortions. How do you keep that fire going within your groups? Yeah, it's really hard, isn't it? Because I do feel that we are seriously in danger of, of uh, losing the gains we've made, let alone sort of progressing. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I think that, I think obviously one has to take care of oneself and be kind to oneself. And, you know, uh, this is not a question about sort of completely burning out by, you know, having to be present at everything and having a say in everything. That's not what I mean by perseverance and resistance. But I think that as long as, and for me, I think that if I lose the anger I have when, when I'm confronted with something, that's when I will lose perseverance. As long as there is that anger, I think we can keep going. And it's using the anger in a good way. I'm not, you know, talking about mindless violence or anything. But insofar as understanding that there is injustice and being angry about the injustice, I think it's possible to motivate and galvanize and be, stay in a movement. It doesn't mean you have to be active and at the center of it all the time. But it just means that, you know, you're there to motivate others as well. So there is no blueprint. But I think that um, perseverance is absolutely necessary because I think if there isn't perseverance, there is no hope. And I think that, you know, really at the end of the day, hope is all that we have and, and our voices um, are all that we have. And it's a combination of two that will keep us going. Um. I think that, that seems to be the, oh, wait a minute. Um, it, it, interesting that you mentioned using, uh, oh, am I, um, no, interesting that you mentioned using our anger in a good way. Uh, how do we utilize this anger without invoking the angry black woman stereotype? <laughs> <laughs> because I think all human beings get angry. I don't think it's a, it's the domain of black women alone. And I think that's what I mean about, you know, the need for solidarity. We, we might have, you know, a lot to shout about as black women, but we sure as hell not going to achieve it if we don't also get our white sisters involved in shouting about those things too. And so I think it's, and, and you know, and it's really about solidarity politics here. Um, I think more and more important for me at this moment in time, if you were to say to me, what is the most important thing we have to do? And I think it's to build solidarity. We're sorely, sorely lacking as, as our social justice movements fragment and implode uh, around identity politics and around all sorts of other things that are taking us down a blind political alley. Um, and that means understanding what's universal about our experiences as well as what's specific and finding ways of being able to frame both you know so i remember back in the 80s when we first started campaigning around domestic violence and we organized protests on the streets it was the first black women's protest against domestic violence in any minority community that this country had seen um, and, you know, we as black women were able to sort of call out what was going on in terms of violence in our families and in our communities and be able to address the specific experiences of women and the concepts of honor and shame that kept women silent in their homes that prevented them from reporting abuse and seeking help. And that allowed men to use concepts of honor and shame to continue the violence and abuse and to normalize it challenging all that required us in leadership positions as black women because uh, we understood those cultural background the context and what it is that we needed to challenge but we also sought the support of white women and i remember at the time very many white women involved in 
campaigns around violence against women or part of the wider feminist movement were nervous because they felt that if they joined us in demonstrations in Southall, somehow they would seem to be racist. And our response was, we're in the leadership position, but we require your solidarity precisely to challenge the racism that, we'll, um, that we will be met with, which is that domestic violence only goes on in black communities. And by showing solidarity, we could both talk about the specificity of, in this case, Asian women's experiences, but also talk about how violence against women happens in all communities, and that as women, we need to challenge this together. So, you know, that's the kind of, that's the tightrope that you have to tread and you have to be aware of um, in how to, in how to, you know, um, avoid, if you like, that angry black woman stereotype. It's about, it's about um, understanding and articulating the specificity of our experiences, but at the same time, um, understanding also that the, the, the being a woman is also a universal condition. Um, about the solidarity issue and the speaking out. Um, I, I, I'm just curious, because in academia, there's a great concern about speaking for other people, mm. especially speaking for people, groups of people that you're not a member of. Mm. And uh, that's sort of, that's like, the concern is sort of fueled, I believe, by, you know, this Western guilt. I guess, yeah. and that sort of leads to um, quietism, really, and that dimension yeah. of solidarity. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious what you make of that, you know, this, you know, concern about, you know, we, we, should, we should just let them do it. Them... Yeah. I, I think it's a really tricky one, right? But I do feel that this whole idea of Western guilt and all of that is actually leading us to nowhere. Um, I actually feel that academia at the moment is in a very bad way in terms of these things, right? Um, and that certain, um, you know, that certain understandings of what is universal of the human condition is actually completely being demolished. And we are losing that kind of universalism for the sake of difference. You know, there's a kind of um, focus on difference as if that's an end in itself. So my, my view would be that there's a difference between speaking um, on behalf of someone and supporting someone who is speaking on behalf of themselves, you know? And, um, and I find this, this is something that is over the years, we've met with this all all the time we're met with this all the time except i think it's got a lot worse where um, even the state because the, the sort of early understandings of notion of multiculturalism was that it's progressive to understand that people are different people have different value systems therefore who are we to intervene and do anything right um, and that was really problematic for us because when it came to, for example, Asian women facing domestic violence or forced marriage or honor-based violence, the state, whether it was the police or social services, would say, we must not intervene. To intervene is to be racist. To intervene is to tell them what to do. To intervene is to, you know, denigrate their own cultural values. And despite our pleading and our insisting that police protect the women or that social services safeguard children um, forced, being forced into a marriage, the state's response was, you know, but it would be seen as racist. It would be seen as culturally insensitive, religiously insensitive is what they use now to do any of these things. But what the logic of that is that we accept the idea that we protect some people and not others, right? The logic of that is certain human rights violations can go unchecked. The logic of that is cultural relativism, right? So we don't apply the same human rights standards equally. So that's, that was the problem with that. And it took us 
huge amount of campaigning to show how forced marriage is a human rights issue and that it isn't just about whites intervening in something. It's actually black women in Africa struggling against it themselves or women in India struggling against it or in Pakistan or wherever, Afghanistan, you know. And so, you know, globally women and, and, and societies are challenging these practices. So the, there isn't a question of white guilt. Yeah, this is a question of human rights. And I think that's the other thing is that it's, you know, whether you are white or black, you've got to call out abuse for abuse. You've got to call out human rights violations for what they are, because otherwise it is going down that slippery road of cultural relativism. And it's basically saying that you can apply different human rights standards to different things or selectively use human rights. Um, now we have another one here. Just let me see. Um, it, it, interesting that you mentioned using anger in a good way. How do we utilize this anger without? Oh well, no, that is the one I've just read. So I think that is um, that is the end question. I've yeah. given a couple of questions as well, um, which are on a completely different subject. How, well, not a completely different subject. How, how can the war in Ukraine provide any opportunity to push back against fundamentalism? Yeah. Um, don't know about uh, not just fundamentalism, but fascism and basically authoritarianism of all kinds, uh, because I think that it is a good opportunity to reassert and reaffirm democratic values and the need for democracies everywhere, not, not the rhetoric that, that the West talks about when it's challenging Russia or whatever, but as, as social justice activists ourselves, you know, reaffirming what it means to live and, and work in a democratic system. And I, so I don't think it's a question of just challenging fundamentalism, it's about challenging ultra-nationalism and authoritarianism um, that we see around the world. And, you know, there isn't just white fascists, there are also brown fascists. We see what's happening in India. We see what's happening in Brazil. You know, these, these places also represent a threat to democracy. These places are also seeing enormous resistance against the kind of um, fascism and authoritarianism that the, you know, of their own governments. And so it's really important that we use this space more than ever to really try to revitalize movements for democracy and to support movements for democracy around the world. And, you know, I think that is so, so important. And at the moment we are seeing, you know, at the geopolitical level, the games that are being played. So now, you know, Boris is no longer cozying up to Russia, but is cozying up to the Saudis, you know, where there are enormous human rights violations going on. You know, and so this is this is the game that they are playing, and somehow the rest of us have got to find ways of of asserting democratic values and defending democratic systems of governance. The other one was how do we challenge conversation unfounded sudden racist, sexist remarks at the dinner table in a way that opens up rather than shuts down communication? <laughs> Someone wanted to know the answer to that. I think it depends on context and who's <laughs> around the dinner table, doesn't it? Yes. Um, and, and, you know, how comfortable you are with people around you. How much you want to eat your dinner. How much you want, <laughs> how much you want to eat your host's dinner, if it happens to be the host. Um, I don't know. I think, I think we've got to move away. Uh, on a more serious level, we've got to move away from what happened in the 80s, which was a moralism and a self-righteousness on the one hand, and a kind of guilt, per, guilt um, sort of ridden paralysis on the other, you know, and both end up paralyzing and, and making it difficult to form, coming back to the idea of solidarity. You know, I remember the 80s, it was driven with this kind of, um, you know, either we're in positions of, of, of self-righteous kind of power as black women or as white women, we are guilt-ridden and too, too, too self-flagellating and therefore not wishing to take 
to challenge anything or say anything for, for fear of being called racist. I don't, I, I don't know how we move away. I think we have to be kind. We have to recognize there's a difference between um, people who are thinking things through, but who may not say the right things. And those people who are not saying the right things and they have the power to do the wrong things, you know, we really have to sort of distinguish. And I think Alicia Garza, the, the founder of the Black Lives Matter movement, makes a very important point when she talks about how she's reflecting on the Black Lives Matter movement and talks about its achievements as well as its things that are troubling her about the movement. And I completely understand when she says, you know, if I work with my white sister, I don't expect her to be fully formed, you know, and, and to be pure. And it's just, it's whether the intentions are good. Mm -hmm. So, and I think we've got to get away from guilt tripping each other or this kind of holier than thou, purest attitude around our political understandings. We've got to, you know, the basic humanity, compassion, decency, I think takes us a long way in trying to form alliances and build solidarity. And the rest is about just helping each other to be more aware and, and to raise consciousness. Catherine, is there another question on that? Yeah, there's two actually. There's one just saying, can you articulate how we can maintain an ACAB politics while advocating for police intervention in domestic violence? What's ACAB? All cops are bastards. All cops are bastards. Okay, I've never heard of that one. Do you know, I find this a very, very challenging area of discussion because I, my, my work throughout the 40 years has involved invoking the state's responsibilities and looking to the state to guarantee human rights. Um, and needing the state to protect and safeguard. So I cannot envision a society without a state. That doesn't mean that there isn't a major struggle in terms of state accountability, in terms of police accountability, in terms of judicial accountability, you know, that needs to take place. Uh, we need to do so much more because the state is, uh, you know, what it is, which is, it has uh, the it, 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 there's a promise of human rights invested in the state, but there is also the oppression that goes on. But I I am not one of these people that thinks that you can do without the police or the state altogether, because I can't see who else would guarantee human rights. Um, and it, for me, the question is about state accountability. Um, so yes, challenge the police on police brutality on stop and search, on data sharing between the police and immigration authorities and all the other things that the police do um, with other state agents. At the same time, we have to rely on the state as women. And the reason I say that is because what's the alternative? The alternative for women is to rely on their own community mechanisms for resolving disputes and resolving matters. And for women, the family itself is unequal. It's patriarchal. And it, um, you know, the family is a space where domestic and sexual violence takes place, where incest and other forms of child abuse take place. So if we turn inwards and rely on communities to resolve this, as women, we will get nowhere. And what will happen is that religion and community institutions that are patriarchal will preside over so-called systems of justice. And we're already seeing that in the UK and elsewhere, where parallel legal systems are being set up along religious lines. And they are run by fundamentalists and religious conservatives. And their whole point in running these justice systems is to maintain patriarchal control and to use these so-called parallel, whether they're Sharia courts or other forms of community mediation to keep women in their place and to deny them the rights that they're entitled to and they can get with struggle 
from the state because the state has signed up to international you know, um, treaties, international conventions on human rights. That is where we have to turn to. Doesn't mean it's perfect. We have to struggle against that. But for me, the alternative is far worse. Um, and that is why the state remains central. But it's again, it's about that intersectional understanding of needing to both challenge the state as well as rely on the state. Now, we still have two more questions. We may have to call a halt to, to these, I think, uh, as the last ones, but I uh, both because uh, they will, may take a longer answer. But I wonder how you view the UK government's allowing people to offer rooms in their homes to Ukrainian nationals fleeing the war, um, where there are Sudanese, Syrian, Palestinian, Congolese, people waiting to enter the UK and Afghan families in hotels. Yeah, it's a problem, isn't it? Um, what can I say? It's racism writ large. Um, there is no denying it. There's no escape from, from, you know, what it is. And it is really, really heartbreaking, actually, because I feel for the Ukrainians. I feel for what they're going through. And I think it's wonderful that, you know, borders are opening up, that people are volunteering in their thousands to support Ukrainian families. And I just don't understand why that same compassion and that same understanding has not been there for other, other refugees. I also am very reluctant to talk about refugees and not migrants. Migrants who are sent back, you know, uh, across the channel in, in, in treacherous waters or, or those who've died in the Mediterranean and, and, and you know, uh, who struggle to get to places of safety. Uh, I am very, very um, saddened, um, but also angry at this kind of obvious, obvious naked um, way in which certain people from certain parts of the world are treated compared to others. And there is no other word for it but racism. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is an opportunity, however, to really call call this out and to expose this, these double standards, to expose the kind of racism that, that you know, is prevalent in the, on the global stage. Um, because I think it will be hard actually to, uh, to, to, for the, you know, to defend the fact that, you know, Ukrainian refugees have been treated in a very different manner mm. to African refugees, those from Africa and the Middle East and Afghanistan and elsewhere, those who are languishing in hotels, um, those who are languishing in their countries, even though they were promised uh, support and help to get over to the UK. So, you know, we, we just have to call this out and we have to make them um, embarrassed. We have to make the government embarrassed, the policy makers embarrassed uh, by the stance that they're taking and constantly remind them of this, the, the, the double standards that exist. Uh, the final question is just to, uh, um, to add the, the note, I, I think, just to develop uh, and safeguarding concerns for women and children to remain free of financial, physical, sexual and other forms of abuse. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Mm. Well, thank you very much. A huge thank you um, from thank Catherine you. and myself. And I'm sure um, everyone um, has. I think Alison Stanley's just left a message um, to all of us. Um, thank you for this really thought provoking discussion. Thank you for this conversation. Thank you, Alison. <laughs> um, you were her trainee, weren't you? Yes. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Pragma, for giving us your time. It's a conversation that started that I'm sure will continue yeah. and run and run and run. Um, thank you very much for everyone attending. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah, well, thank you. This, I agree, it was a fabulous session, really wonderful. Thank you very much for inviting me.